yes, I'll try to remember that phrase. So, are yeah, it's okay if you just leave my mom. Just if you just get well, good afternoon, everyone. It is 4 or 2. You can tell the various people makers. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, I don't know. Did any of you go to the talk last night? Okay, cool. Great. Perfect. So, uh, my name is Richard Breckler. I'm going to talk a little bit about the PPC. Veronica is going to talk a little bit about purgatory. I do have a class at 5. I'm sorry. So, I'll probably see that about 4.50. But if you guys have questions, like want to chat, reach out, you know, just shoot me an email or whatever. Also, pretty much everyone in campus study is just very open to talking about anything. So I hope that this is informational for all of you. It's helpful. Um, all right. So I think that's the most introduction remarks we need. So we can go ahead and get started. All right. So this is quick fair. I know that we're trying to keep this tuner down the account, but we just say the words very hard and I will do that. So may the Father and Son be free. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is born. Give us this day our daily bread, and bring us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into the future, but deliver us to you. Amen. May Father and Son. All right. So, speaking ex cathedra. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, talking about the papacy, just like I guess for my general information, how many of you are Catholic in here? Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and then I, I'm guessing there's a few people who are who are non-Catholic, questioning like the papacy, which I understand. I, the papacy, especially, especially like coming from a non-Catholic perspective, is challenging. But even today, as a Catholic, the papacy is something that's hard sometimes to accept. Especially, you know, communication is so instant that whatever the Pope says can easily be misconstrued, or sometimes it might not be misconstrued, and it might not be the easiest thing. To um, so the papacy is something that I think, whether you're Catholic or non-Catholic, it's something important for us to approach reverently um, and also with, with the right spirit of question. Okay. So to begin, um, on the handout, I included a quick quote from John Henry Cardinal Newman. So he's pretty well known on this campus as he should. You know, the idea of a university is great. Uh, a lot of you are probably also familiar with his conversion story. He was an Anglican. Um, he was looking at the church fathers. He realized that he had to be Catholic. And so um, this quote doesn't tie specifically to the papacy, but I, I just wanted to put it out there. Uh, just for those of you who are seeking, you know, again, whether you're like officially in the Catholic fold or not, all of us are seeking truth. And I think. Newman has this beautiful quote where he says, he's describing his conversion and, and finally comes to a point where he says, and thus again, I was led on to examine more attentively what I doubt not was in my thoughts long before, viz. the concatenation of argument by which the mind descends from its first to its final religious idea. And I came to the conclusion that there was no medium in true philosophy between atheism and Catholicism and Catholicity. And that a perfectly consistent mind under those circumstances in which it finds itself here below must embrace either the one or the other. That's a pretty bold statement. <laughs> um, nonetheless, I just wanted to present to you guys, it's challenging and in a way, right? Like who am I, who am I to present that statement to those of you who aren't in the Catholic faith? Because I was born a Greek Catholic. Who am I to bring that statement to your attention? Because I, I've never had that opportunity to have that philosophical courage that you needed to convert to what you saw as truth. So all I can do is, is claim that I'm holding to the truth of faith. And yet, for those of you who are discerning whether or not to make the jump, like, prayers go out to you because you're in a situation that I, I never will be. And I, I, it's, I realize that. And so I'll, 
I'll, I'll try to be as helpful as I can to you and talk about legacy, but I also want to just be really sympathetic to your questions, um, to sort of the difficulties that you're, you're going through uh, that I, I will probably never like have the chance to go through. Okay, so that being said, Newman aside, uh, I just wanted to talk about the elephant in the room. So that would be um, <clears throat> the bad folks. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I just thought it'd be sort of humorous. I, I went to Google and I was like, bad folks, you know, I, I want to be able to figure this out. And so the Wikipedia has this page on a book about the bad folks. And I'll just read some of these funny fellows to you. So there's Pope Stephen the Sixth, who had his predecessor uh, exhumed, tried, defingered, gracefully reburied, and thrown in the tiger. <laughs> Great record. Um, there's Pope John the Twelfth, who gave land to a mistress. Obviously, he wasn't practicing celibacy. Murdered several people, broke the Fifth Commandment, and was killed by a man who probably had death his wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> that might be the worst one here, but I don't know. Uh, there's also Pope Benedict IX, who sold the papacy, Pope Boniface VIII, uh, <laughs> lampooned in Dante's Divine Comedy, so all you lip lovers can enjoy that. Uh, Pope Everett VI, who complained that he did not hear enough screaming from cardinals who had conspired against him when they were tortured. <laughs> Pope Alexander VI, um, he was guilty of nepotism and whose unattended corpse swelled until it could barely fit in a closet. That's brutal. Pope Leo X, a spendthrift member of the Medici family, who once that spent one seventh of his predecessor's reserves on a single ceremony. Pope Clement VII, uh, also Medici, whose power politicking with France, Spain, and Germany got run sad. Okay. I probably didn't need to read all of them, but I sort of found it funny. <laughs> um, obviously, I shouldn't find it funny, but. <laughs> but sometimes you look at these popes and it's just like, wow, how did the church survive? Okay, so going a little more deeply then. Whenever we're talking about the papacy, like we're not claiming that the popes are perfect. Historically, there's evidence, obviously, that they aren't perfect. And so I think it really helps when, when you're trying to explain the Catholic perspective, you being honest with the limitations of what you're explaining. Um, we're not claiming for the Pope to be sort of a magic wizard. Uh, so if you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and obviously there's other like historical documents and everything that specifies it, um, but the Catechism, I believe the paragraph starts around like 889, 888, if you want to reference it later. So they're talking about the teaching office. And pretty much the Catechism is talking about the magisterium, so the Pope and in union with the bishops. And so the Pope does have infallibility, but only under certain conditions, only when he's speaking ex cathedra on faith and morals. So that may all sound like well and good, but that is shocking and hard to swallow. Uh, and so again, thinking about like, how are we limiting this I don't want to say limiting because it sounds like I'm apologizing for the office and I'm not. Um, but the reality of the situation is that the Pope isn't bringing anything new to the table. The Pope is an anchor uh, who clarifies when questions arise. Like if you think about it, would it, the, the papacy serves more as something to preserve the church rather than to add new things to it. So for the Catholic, for the Catholic position, uh, we understand that there's a deposit of faith. So once the last apostle died, uh, there was no new revelation that's going to come about. So like even Marian apparitions and things, no Catholic has to believe in them because uh, even, even though the church will approve them, no Catholic has to believe in Marian apparitions because that was after the deposit. And so the Pope, whenever he's clarifying something, let's say the assumption, for example, uh, that's obviously a, a quite an easy topic at Oakville College. The Pope isn't adding that to the doc, to the, the deposit of faith, to what the Catholic Church believes. Rather, um, he's helping preserve the reality of the faith. There was always a belief in 
making assumptions spread throughout the whole entire church. Was that was that controversial at times? Yes, but there was always that residue of that faith, that resonance deep down embedded within all throughout um, the, the religious community. And so the Pope served there to preserve that faith when it was coming under attack. Um, and obviously, like this argument, I don't really like because uh, it sounds a little finagling, but there is it, it is it is valid to point out that once once you don't have a pope, something else fills that vacuum. So whether whether you suddenly your religious denomination uh, becomes super political and the emperor or the king fills that vacuum that the pope had, or let's say you know like there's a lot of very good Protestant denominations. They do a lot of good work, but note the plural. There's denominations. There's thousands of millions. And so that, that's a worn out argument. Um, and I understand that at Hillsdale freshman year, everyone hears this argument back and forth. But it is valid to point out again, when you don't have the Pope, something goes amiss. Uh, you either split into multiple denominations or some political power comes in and sucks up that back. So the point there is when we don't have the papacy, there's, there's a sin that's missed. And yet, at the same time, it's a challenge, right, for anyone who's approaching the papacy. Like, how can we, how can we accept it, especially when we have such fatally flawed popes? And, you know, the great what if, right? What if a pope would say something on faith and morals sitting ex cathedra Like, what if he would? Um, historically, that's never been an issue, but that's sort of a, a, a temptation, right, to our faith. Uh, what if the Pope would say something? Now, by faith, one can say that's never going to happen. God's grace promises that it won't, um, but that's a challenge. So pretty briefly, right, just to recap, I've talked about the bad Popes, tried to limit, well, not limit, but but talk about like the reality of papal office. So now, especially for like everyone in the room, the question is how, where does, where is this valid in scripture? Like where do you get this idea from? Um, so again, I, I think a lot of you are probably pretty familiar with these arguments. So I'm going to try to keep it at an apt level um, for everyone. So I'm sorry if it's repetitive, but it is important to go back to the scriptural basis. <laughs> so uh, for the Catholic position, we do go back to Matthew 16, right? And that's where that's where Christ is asking his apostles, who do you say that I am? Um, verse 16, Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So that is a lot of like the scriptural sort of seed um, of the truth of the papacy. Obviously, this is something that I don't, I'm not sure what it's like to be Protestant, but at least as a Catholic, Scriptures are very alive, partially because we've never had a period where the successors of Peter and the rest of the bishops haven't stopped telling us about it, right? Like there's this oral tradition, there's this oral memory, there's this living history that we are a part of where Peter, yes, the scripture is part of this, but Peter was also going about, people were, had this acknowledgement of Peter as the leader of the church and that succession kept going. Um, so, you can do a lot of scriptural scholarship on this. I would recommend if you're interested in the question, Dr. Scott Ahn has some resources. Um, but things like looking at, you know, Peter, Rock, uh, I believe there's a debate about like Petra is sort of the, the big rock and then Petrus or something is, is, a, is a tiny pebble. And so sometimes people are reading the Greek and try to say like, Christ is, you know, diminutive. It's a little bit of a rabbit hole, but 
long story short, Christ probably wasn't speaking in Greek anyway. And also when it makes sense for him to call like Peter, hey Petrino. <laughs> like so if you're concerned about that argument, we can talk more about it. Um, but there's always more details. Uh and scholarship it seems again and again uh to, to support the papacy. Um now there's also in the Acts of the Apostles evidence where the apostles would defer to Peter, like at the Council of Jerusalem. Uh, again and again, like who do you see doing the first during doing the first preaching, doing the first healing? It's Peter again and again and again. Um, and so again, like we can go more into those details if you'd like. I'm gonna try to keep respectful of everyone's time. Okay. So I think I think in hindsight, right? So again, we've looked at the bad folks, we've looked at sort of what the, the position is of the papacy. Uh, it really does have a limited nature. And then we look at a little bit of the scriptural evidence. I know that this is like going 500 miles an hour. If you want more of the historical nitty gritty scriptural details, I'm not a scholar myself. I've, I can talk you through like what I know or try to point you in the right direction. Um, but I think in closing, so, I, when I've talked to, to a friend who talks about it, there's this overwhelming like gut fear, um, like this, this is really concern. And I, and I, I agree that they should be concerned if this is the truth, that somehow the Pope distances us from the reality of scripture. Um, that's not the case at all. Actually, in a lot of ways, having the Pope Freeze, freeze one to live the gospel so much more openly because scriptural interpretation, it is super important, right? For all of us to encounter a scripture on a daily basis. But like, there's something a little different, I would argue. I This is sort of a thought that came into my head, so don't, don't make this the last argument, but like there's something different between encountering scripture and interpreting. So, you know, like just imagine seeing Jesus on a day-to-day -day basis, like there's something different when you can just let yourself go in awe and be moved by him purely in the depths of your heart versus always watching him and observing him and being like, okay, he's five foot 11. <laughs> he has tight, like baby blood type. He seems a little collared, he seems a little thick. Like, <laughs> you know, like there's just a difference. Um, and so I would argue having BBC actually allows for one to encounter scripture uh, more freely because the weight of interpretation, yes, we should, we should do all we can, right, to understand scripture. But it's there's like there's a sense, right, when when suddenly like scriptural interpretation is weighing on you. I would think that at a certain point that would that would start to be crippling a little bit. And I, I, I want to be very careful and reverent to our Protestant brothers and sisters because, look, guys, especially those who are Catholic, we all admit, like, it's a, it's a skeleton in the closet, right, that Protestants seem to love the scriptures a lot more than we do. And that's our issue. Because who believed the scriptures? Like, it was a Catholic church. It was a church that selected them. It was a church that loved them. And it was God who gave them to us. And so I want to commend a lot of my Protestant brothers and sisters for their reverence for scripture. Um, and I would like to invite them that in some ways, having the papacy actually unleashes the power of the gospel in a way that when you're the one always trying to like figure it out, you don't necessarily have that freedom of the power. So that's, that's point one, you know, just hope as, Hope is anchor. I think a lot of us have heard that argument again and again. Um, also, there's this fear, right? Like, if I believe in the papacy, that's going to like change my life. Well, if that means becoming Catholic, like, yes, it will change your life because your life will suddenly become like this this direct bond, like this direct intimate meaning with Christ every time you receive your Eucharist, right? But it actually doesn't change your daily life. Day life. I am not worried about what Pope. I mean. I'm worried about the scandal that might occur if a pope 
says certain things, but I'm not checking the news to like figure out what Pope Francis says. I'm not worried that Pope Francis is gonna say like one must one must die at one point five percent or something. Like your day to day life doesn't change because of the papacy. It really doesn't, <laughs> unless you're just a political junkie and like want to read all of the like news outlets on Pope Francis. Like it, it doesn't change. So you, so again, if, you, if you're worried about that, like take deep breath, it's fine. The papacy is not this frightening, maniacal. I'm going to be able to boss you around and tell you like what political leaders you have to have. It's not of that. Um, and then finally, my last point. So. I think, I think in a way this is the most important. Like freshman year, I remember being so irritated, like in a sad way, whenever I talked to my Protestant brothers and sisters, because I was like, all the reasons are here. Why don't they see it? And they similarly had the same like situation. Oh, okay. And for those of you who knew me freshman year, I wasn't the best in here anyway. <laughs> 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 but B, but B, like, uh, they felt the same way. And finally, the thing is, like the papacy, you can you can argue about it until you're blue in the face. You can have all the right reasons. You can have all the social evidence. But the fact is, is that it's not a matter of like a scientific logarithm. It's not a matter of proof. It's a matter of two things: obedience to Christ and faith. I believe in the papacy not because I want to. I believe in it because, or, and it's not even because the church tells me to. It's because Christ is this. Like, there's something to, to be said for Christ has said this. Christ has set this up for us. And so it's not a matter of trying to say, we Catholics are right. Like, we Catholics should be terrified because it was a scandal of the popes that often drove people away from the church that Christ founded. Um, so, yeah, like the papacy, it's a matter of obedience to Christ. It's not even a matter of obedience to the Pope. It's a matter of obedience to Christ. Um, and finally, like, well, final, final point, it's also just a matter of faith. Like, I can, I, I'm obviously not the best, like, scholar on the papacy anyway, but it doesn't matter. You could get the most renowned people scholar, like, you could probably get, you know, Dr. Gaetano, like, Dr. Lindley, all these people who converted they could follow them and had to read the claim of these issues like and they can they can defend their story and they can defend their faith but at a certain point it's not going to come down to the argument it is a matter it is a gift of faith so if you are struggling with the question like about the papacy whether you're catholic or non-catholic it is okay to struggle with the question and it is a it is a gift of god like it's just one point. Grace is grace. So if you're struggling, like yes, look into the arguments, but pray. Pray for obedience to Christ and pray for faith. So I think that's it for me. All right. Out, but I didn't hand out her. Okay. Hi, guys. I'm Veronica. We're talking about another hot topic, namely the Let me ask what topic we're doing. Why are we doing this? And I really actually like what you just said at the end that a lot of these topics really are gifts of faith. Um, and so I'm not really here to give you the most airtight argument I can find for why you should absolutely do the territory, but I am here to share just like basically what I know so we can help understand each other better. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep them off this fucking bed. But um, when I was preparing for this talk, I decided to start. Um, in the catechism, the section on final judgment. So that's the, the first few things you see in your handout are from the catechism. Um, and I read, death puts an end to human life as the time opens to either accepting or rejecting the divine grace manifested in Christ. 
the New Testament speaks of judgment from Naomi in the past, like the final event of Christ, the second coming, um, also repeatedly affirmed that each will be rewarded immediately after death in accordance with his works of faith. Um, and it references the Bible story of the poor man Lazarus, um, and there's other New Testament texts that speak of the final destiny of the soul. And I read this and I thought, okay, so I think this is something that generally Christians can agree on that there will be a final judgment, it's very difficult, um, that ultimately people will be going to heaven um, or to hell. Um, but then the catechism goes on further and says, each man receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of his death. In a particular judgment, there occurs his life to Christ. Either entering into blessed, blessedness of he blessedness of heaven through purification, or immediately, or immediate and everlasting damnation. Um, and so in the Catholic view, there's the third option that comes in, um, which is not immediate entrance into heaven, it's um, entrance um, into blessedness first through a purification. Um, and this is what we are talking about when we talk about purgatory. Um, I think I wrote in the handouts basically that it is this process of purification that makes the soul ready to um, enter heaven and then verbatim from the catechism, further down, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly pure, imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Um, so at this point I just want to point out some like maybe obvious uh, but basic points that purgatory is kind of more of a state than a place outside of space and time. Um, we don't really know how it works in that but <laughs> um, and it's I just want to re-emphasize it's a state that always ultimately results in reaching heaven and never hell is never a perfect state that's not going to end up before you can stay there. So in case anyone is thinking that you guys will do that all together already. Um, <laughs> and then when we say purification we do mean purification but it's the judgment of God. Um, but now let's get a little bit more into it. So I've seen all this, and I thought that um, the part that most non-Catholics are uncomfortable with when it comes to the idea of purgatory is this idea that we even need to undergo um, any sort of any sort of purification in order to quote unquote achieve the holiness necessary to enter heaven. Um, so it seems like the main objection kind of revolves around this idea of achieving or earning or somehow being worthy of our salvation. Um, that God needs us to be perfect um, in order to let us in heaven. Um, the main, I think the main objection of this is um, that we'll die. God died for our sins, once and for all. There's no need for any sort of like, extra reparation on our parts or anything like that. Um, and honestly, this is like a whole other discussion, but um, in just like how we understand salvation in general and the cross and all that. But I'm going to say, um, at least a bit on that. I want to point out that, um, so as Catholics, we believe that our entire lives are meant to be a transformation or a sort of, sort of purification. It's like this slow sort of upward climb towards greater unity with God. Um, we do believe, obviously, that Christ died for our sins, but we don't say that they were simply covered over. Um, and I know there's very, I don't want to like necessarily just blanket statement, all Protestants, but I know a good chunk of them think about it in that way. Um, I, I guess we kind of see that through Christ's cross, he made, he actually made our transformation back to perfect unity with him, like before the fall possible again. Um, and so like the reason that Catholics focus so much on suffering and like the Christ dying on the cross and not simply like an empty cross, um, with the, him resurrected is because we believe that through Christ's suffering, he sanctified suffering. Um, and so it made like our own suffering kind of a, a part of our own means to salvation. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but like he says in, in the Bible, like we need to take up our crosses daily and follow him. Um, and like we live just as he lived. And so like suffering is just like a very real powerful important thing um and we really do believe that like maybe Barrett's can talk about like faith and hearts but we believe that our agency is very important 
own as well. That's what it's about. It's just kind of like our entire life is kind of this path of transformation and purification. And also part of the reason I kind of went on this little thing, I guess, is because I just wanted to emphasize that like our our belief in purgatory is kind of continuous with our idea of life now. Um, it'll just be like almost like a continued but maybe more intense, possibly accelerated, I don't know, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, purification before we enter heaven. Um, but now going back to um, talking more about like, what purgatory is or looks like. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the art depictions of purgatory, but usually it's depicted as pretty scary. There's a lot of flames everywhere. Um, you know, people in pain. Like, oh, kind of like a, something like a hell, but like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> um, it, like it's kind of scary. Um, but what I really want to emphasize is that purgatory is meant to be first and foremost a profound gift, actually, um, and not something to be feared, which is super interesting because I think a lot of people have like, think about purgatory and like, like, like it's not something to be feared, uh, and primarily because the fire is fire of God's love. Um, and like, and honestly, I was thinking about this, and we're not actually that unfamiliar with this language of purification. Like in scripture, it talks about like the gold being refined in fire, and like there's all this imagery of like God being fire, like a pillar of fire and burning bush, um, and things like that. Um, but yeah, so I was reading somewhere and probably you haven't stopped there. It was like the turn of the century for that. But um, that um, basically purgatory is the soul's experience of God's immense love and absolute justice. Um, and that it's because it's the experience of, of his love that it's painful, which sounds kind of strange. Um, but it also makes sense that every single thing gift that we have from God is done out of love. I think a lot of people feel purgatory and think like, ah, judgment, punishment, damnation, but it's like, of course it's all about love because that is what like God is always all about. I don't know. Um so it's not like it's not like this um I this weird tough toxic love. It's like I'm punishing you because I love because I love you and like I, it's not like that. Um Although it is still kind of intense to understand. So yeah, back to this idea that purgatory is like the soul's experience of God's immense love. Um, and it's painful. Why? Um, it's painful because the soul can see the love of God in a pure way and can therefore understand that anything less than an utterly consuming devotion to God is painfully unjust. Um, and so the sufferer, the sufferer is seeing is primarily seeing how unjust it has been for them to separate themselves from God in any sort of way um, throughout their lives. And and I, that's how we view sin too as Catholics and like um I mean there's orders of sin, but like sin is just like a separation between you and God. Um, but um some of what we know about about purgatory comes from um, kind of like private revelation from mystics. So one of them is St. Faustina, who lived from 1905 to 1958. Um, she had visions of souls in purgatory and she asked the souls she saw in the vision what their greatest suffering was. And they said it was a longing for God. Um, not because he wasn't present there, which apparently that's, that's another thing is like when you're in purgatory, you're not separated from God. I guess you're um, but because I guess it's kind of like they could see how unjust all of their little separations had been. Um, and as an extra note, um, she also learned that the souls could not pray for themselves without a purgatory, um, so that we actually need to pray for them. So that's why you hear about Catholic praying for certain people. But just to kind of sum up this idea that purgatory is about experiencing the fire of God's love. I'm going to quote another mystic, uh, St. Catherine of Genoa. Um, she's known as the Apostle of Purgatory, I guess. 
Um, and she wrote in her treatise on Peter Joy, either in this life or in the life to come, the soul that keeps being with God must be purged by the fiery love of God. The holy souls are purged of all the rust and stains of sin which they have not rid themselves in this life. The fire of purgatory is first of all the fiery love of God. Um, yeah. So I guess now that I've kind of explained more about what it is, Okay, well, where does it come from? Why do you believe it? I guess I mentioned a couple of mythics, but you know, where does it say that in the Bible, right? Um, <laughs> so, as most of you know, Catholics believe what they believe from both um, scripture and tradition. Um, and a lot of what we think about purgatory does come from private revelation, um, but it wasn't actually the more modern mystics that we first got the idea from. It was uh, more like the visions of the more modern mystic confirmed what um, people in the pretty early church were already thinking. Um, so even in the account of the martyrdom of perpetual felicity, Perpetua was talking about vision. She had a brother um, first in a place of suffering and then later um, him reaching a place of perpetual peace. Um, and also in the early church, there's references for Tertullian, um, Cyril of Jerusalem. And I mean, Augustine talked a lot about it too. Um, references to like prayers for the dead um and then i will go it's on the back of your handout are some passages of scripture that various people have interpreted to point to purgatory as well so we have isaiah 4 4 when the lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of zion and cleansed the blood stains of jerusalem in the midst of a spirit of judgment by a spirit of burning um i guess we interpreted that one as purgatory um, and then I quoted Maccabees also, even though I know it's not in Protestant Bibles, but the Catechism um, has this in their description. It says, For if we were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, his holy and pious thought, therefore, he made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. So if, if it was only the case that there was heaven or hell, hell it would be too late, heaven they would be prepared. So they're praying for the dead, they're in a place of purification. Um, and then we have Corinthians, it says, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest. And the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire. The fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Um, and St. Cyprian, Ambrose, Jerome, Pope Gregory the Great, um, St. Augustine, they all believe that this part of the scripture was indeed purgatory as well. Um, and the last one I have is Hebrews 12, 14. It says, strive with all men and strive for peace with all men, not strive with all men. Um, <laughs> and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Um, and blessed John Henry uh, Newman, is he a saint now or is he still a blessed saint? Sorry. Um, and apparently he said this as an Anglican, um, said this about this on um, purgatory. He said, and I think this is actually one of the most important thoughts um, in this talk. Um, even supposing a man of unholy life were suffered to enter heaven, he would not be happy there, so that it would be no mercy to permit him to enter. There is a moral malady which disorders the inward sight of the peace, and no man laboring under it is in a condition to enjoy what scripture calls the fullness of joy in God's presence. Um, so this just reiterates that purgatory is first and foremost meant to be a mercy. Um, it's like we would not be able to, with the weight of sin weighing us down and kind of um, messing up, for a lack of a better word, our, our sights, um, we, we, we aren't able to enjoy God's fullness without this purification. And so it, purgatory is meant to be first and foremost a mercy. Um, so that we can enter more actually fully into fulfillment and joy, which I think is really cool. 
I mean, not gonna lie, the idea of purgatory is still really intense and like a lot, I think, it means for a lot of Catholics. But I mean, I learned a lot from Franco's talk. Um, and I just wanna make one final note. Um, I just wanna, um, yeah, note that the Catechism does acknowledge that immediacy of reaching heaven is still a possibility. It's not like every single person, like, oh, we're all sinners, like, we're all going to purgatory. I mean, it's true that of course, Chris jokes, that's true. Like, oh, I'll probably have to for that one. Um, <laughs> but um, the Catechism does acknowledge like, not having to even go to purgatory at all, at all as an option. And I think we do believe that there are certain people who have experienced that. Um, and St. Red is a funny example of somebody who really believed this and really like wanted to be one of the people who didn't have to go through into um, territory with my kids. I think that is actually part of it. Yeah, I will. I'll try to um, remember it. But basically, uh, St. Therese in her convent of nuns, it was kind of well known that she was praying to God, like, don't let me go to territory. Let me go straight to you after. I want to go straight to you. Um, and there was this older nun who thought, it's just not right. Like, she can't pray for no or even, you know, this month was all like fire and brimstone, God's judgments. Um, and Therese basically said, if it's God's justice that you want, if it's God's justice you will get, but I prefer his mercy. So, and she was like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, and then it said that after this nun died, she would, like appeared to Therese in a vision or something like that, and I actually don't know. And basically, Therese, you were right. Like, <laughs> you, yes, you were right. And she was in purgatory, she won against justice, you know. So I don't really know what that means for you and me personally, because we're also not paying for rent, but it's not necessarily true that we'll have a So um, I think that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you all so much for questions. We can try to see questions. Yeah. Yes. So um when you say like like, oh, you know, you go to purgatory and, you know, we kind of talk about like spending X amount of time in purgatory. Right. So, like, could you maybe like explain a little bit more, like, how that is meant, like, doing it nowadays? Maybe, like, it's like about five time. So, we can't actually say, like, you spend five minutes in purgatory or something. Like, I, I know some people talk about it, like, intensity in your work. I don't yeah, know. I, I, I literally don't know. Like, I don't know how to think outside of space and time. Does anyone else? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> 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 it is a state of the soul, and it is confusing too because we are meant to pray for them. So it's like, you know, you kind of find yourself thinking about that love on you. Like, God, oh, is going for ritual or then in heaven? And that's automatically mm -hmm. thinking that's in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, I don't know, but I don't know if anyone else has thought that. Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Um, I have a friend whose mother passed away, and she had a Catholic tell her, I'm praying for your mother's soul. And she was really upset by that. And she's like, that just negates Christ, Christ's work on the cross. And my, my mother's soul went to heaven. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. And so I I didn't know what to say when she said that to me. She, she was are really you, are you Catholic? Catholic? Um, I, I'm not. I'm not okay. Catholic. But I, I'm also, I also believe in purgatory. Okay. So <laughs> I, I just didn't know what to say because I'm not, I'm not educated enough to to respond, but I guess how would you respond or anyone? First of all, I'd say that's completely factual. You know, say that to people who probably do that. But um, I, I think that like you could affirm her, like, yes, she probably is going to heaven. And like, regardless of whether you believe there's going to be a purification process or not, like, you believe, like, your mom believed you was a good Christian. Like, I don't, like, there isn't, even if they are in purgatory, like, there is no reason to despair. Like, being in purgatory is like obviously a painful thing, but like mm -hmm. a joyful thing. Like they're on their way to heaven. So, so I don't know if that would really console her, but yeah. I think else is on that. Yeah, I think she's this particular, and I guess this is this would be like for a different talk, but just she's particularly stuck on it negates Christ's work on the cross. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. it's also Christ's work on the cross that you know, allows you to be purified in purgatory without Christ. Like, but Christ will always kind of going to help. Like, yeah. I mean, am I speaking on the Is that like, oh, it's not kind of. We are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. We don't believe that it negates that. 
kind of the reasons I tried to explain with how we understand cross. But anyway. yes, I think too, like that's fantastic. And something that Dr. B. Whalen said that really opened my eyes to was that Christ died, yes, to save us from sin, but he didn't rightly order our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why we are still human, and we still fall into sin. And that sin can still alter our soul. And so that soul is not yet perfect to give to God. So he did give us the means by which we can get to eternal life. But we as humans are still fallen and cannot do that. And this is the case. Any questions on the PC? Or should we do you have to know why, like, this? Well, you know, the Romans killed St. Peter. Uh -huh. And then his bell got dumped in a ditch there. And so mm -hmm. so pretty much like that's sort of the, the um, okay. Nice. Yeah. So we can take more to this idea, but I I believe it, it has a lot to do with uh the reality of Peter died in Rome. And then his successors followed in his uh, train. So I think if you're if, if you know people are looking for more like early church evidence, Justin Martyr wrote about um, emphasized the, su the successors of Peter, and they were all in Rome. And so Peter was bishop of Rome, and so that's why like it's Rome, not Jerusalem. So there was probably you know that confluence of like geopolitical. Um, elements as well, but we can also trust that the Holy Spirit wanted Peter and Rome. Um, so, I have a question actually. Is it Amber? Yeah. So, what um, denomination are you you believe purgatory under the Protestant Church? Well, I I want to become Catholic. Okay. Okay. I was like, are there Protestants that believe in purgatory? Like, I should know this. She's <laughs> not. <laughs> Yeah, the <laughs> 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 <laughs